Hi, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here. Thanks, Michelle, and all the organizers for thinking to invite me. I, um, I was saying uh, to Michelle earlier, I remember being part of Torbug as a postdoc when I was at SickKids. So it's very nice to be back, even though we're all virtual. Um, and today I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about glioblastoma. My talk title is very general, uh, but I, I basically want to talk about the complexity of glioblastoma and ways that we're approaching um, trying to, to um, integrate multiple um, layers of data together. Okay, so, um, so glioblastoma, you may be familiar with this type of brain cancer. It's the most malignant brain tumor in adults. It is always fatal. Um, it's treated with aggressive surgery, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy. And even despite this aggressive treatment, by, by the five-year mark, only 5% 5 of people um, survive. Um, in the last, in the last um, over 15 years, so it's, it's going to be almost 20 years now, the major advance in this tumor type has been the introduction of this type of chemotherapy called temozolomide to the, to the clinical protocol, and that improves the average survival with the disease by about a couple of months. So that's the best that's been done um, in the last couple of decades for this cancer in terms of clinical outcome. Now, in terms of understanding the disease, um, a lot more uh, progress has been made. Um, glioblastoma was, was the, the first tumor that was um, profiled by the, uh, the TCGA. So the landmark paper came out in 2008. It seems like a long time ago now. That, paper basically outlined the major genetic drivers of the disease, uh, the major subtypes. Since then, lots of other work um, has gone out to delineate the fact that these tumors are really, um, really heterogeneous in terms of the kinds of um, functional states that cells can have within the tumor. So it's thought that recurrences um, are, are really driven by the existence of these cancer stem-like cells, so GBM stem-like cells. These cells can survive radiation and chemotherapy and re reconstitute the tumor after, uh, after treatment. Um, there is a lot of work done on the biology of GBM stem-like cells. There's lots of influences in terms of their regulation uh, from cell intrinsic uh, mechanisms like um, their mutations, driver mutations, epigenetic state. And then there are lots of influences on cancer stem, stem cell function from uh, from the microenvironment or cell extrinsic factors. And it's not just cancer stem cells. Um, as a whole, this tumor is very heterogeneous. And so these, these cells don't, um, uh, they, they, the, the tumor is highly infiltrative. And so the cells, the cancer stem cell live in particular niches throughout the tumor, but to, the tumor is very varied, um, not only in the types of cancer cells that it harbors, but also in the kinds of non-cancer cells that it harbors. So here is an illustration of the kinds of cells one might find in a, in a tumor microenvironment. These are non-malignant cells, but nevertheless, they play a really uh, important role in tumor progression and invasion and response to therapy. Um, and a large part of, um, uh, of this role is actually um, driven by microglia and these so-called MTSCs, so these myeloid-derived suppressor cells, which are basically macrophages. So the immune cells resident to the brain, microglia, and then the recruited cells um, upon inflammation from the rest of the, uh, from, uh, from systemic sources. So this complex ecosystem, this complex ecosystem is really what underlies the aggressiveness of the tumor and the ability or the, the ability of the cells to survive treatment. Um, and so the way that we're tackling understanding this complex system um, is multiomic and it relies on having access to really specific kinds of samples that lend themselves to this type of multiomic profiling. So we need to understand single cell level data. We need to understand the spatial organization of the tumor. Uh, we need to understand the relationship of genetic clones to each other. And we need to understand this in a spatial context uh, because cells that are actively invading versus the ones in the core of the tumor are doing really different things and relying on different pathways. And when the surgery happens, you're taking away part of the cells, and it's the ones that are left over that we need to be able to develop better targeted therapies for. And so we have um, a biobank at the University of Calgary where we bank, um, we try to bank every tumor where it's feasible, where we can get samples from surgery. 
Um, this tumor bank is run by Dr. Jennifer Chen, and it's really comprehensive in the types of samples that can be collected and stored. So of course, FFPE is the mainstay of biobanking efforts around the world. Um, we also bank flash frozen tumor pieces, and these are great for anything where you need DNA, really high quality DNA, RNA, protein. Um, we try to bank multiple pieces of a tumor because again, that spatial relationship is really important. And we try to bank both naive and treatment resistant um, um, samples when available from the same patient, otherwise whatever is available. And then finally, there's also cryoprotected tissue, which is really critical for um, single cell profiling and also for making models. So we have a number of models and these have been part of big projects um, um, in, in the last few years. So growing these uh, stem-like cells, so brain tumor initiating cells in culture in vitro. Uh, these can also be implanted in mice to make patient-derived xenografts, uh, which can be studied with spatial approaches or other approaches. And then there's also a pipeline for these direct PDXs where you skip this in vitro selection step and you make direct PDXs. And for here, you can establish um, cell culture as well. So it's really comprehensive banking effort and it really lets us leverage um, multiple kinds of samples for doing multiomics for these tumors in order, in order to better understand their biology. And so I'm not gonna talk about um, anything on this side uh, in today's talk. I wanna focus on a project which we started a while back where we've, um, we've taken a um, cohort of patients for which we have multi-regional and longitudinal sampling um, in, from FFP material. So in this cohort of patients, we have these FFP blocks taken around the tumor core, edge, et cetera, um, and before and after therapy. And from the same block, we take core punches um, and we array them on a, oops, on a tissue microarray so that on one tissue microarray, we, we can represent the whole cohort of patients. And for this, we've done spatial profiling um, from the very next core, right next door, we also do uh, global proteomics. And from the very next core, we can do exomes. And so the hope with this kind of approach is that we can answer specific questions that have to do with, with tumor, tumor cell biology and evolution and response to treatment. So we want to know what gene expression programs are unique or enriched in the recurrences. This is one of the aspects of our cohort that's unique uh, or a bit different than um, what others have done. Um, how are these expression programs interlinked with mutation profiles? We know from the literature that certain drivers predispose towards certain tumor cell states, so we would like to understand that. What gene expression programs operate in a spatially dependent manner? Because again, in a solid tumor, architecture really matters. Um, so for instance, what are the expression programs that operate in the leading edge of the tumor, where there aren't too many tumor cells, but they're doing something really unique, which is actively invading. Um, and then finally, what cells in the tumor microenvironment cooperate with GBM cells, and how does that relationship change throughout disease progression and with treatment? Um, so part of our cohort uh, includes these samples that I call it the XYZ cohort. It's where we have um, samples from sort of the, the more hypoxic central, really highly dense areas of the tumor, um, samples from this Y region, which is which is what on an MRI is the contrast enhancing border. That's where the blood, blood brain barrier has broken down and the contrast agent is getting in. It's really highly vascularized and that vasculature is really leaky. So that is a completely different kind of microenvironment. And then we have Z, which is the leading edge. So that's the part that's usually not resected by surgery. Those are the cells that are left behind. And the hope is that chemo and radiation is going to um, uh, is, is going to eliminate those cells, which of course is not the case. And finally, are the answers to these questions the same if we were to sample different biomolecules? Uh, so specifically, do we, do we find the same relationships and the same gene expression programs when we, um, when we sample uh, transcripts versus proteins? And the answer um, is not one I'm gonna talk about today, but I wanna, what I wanna talk about oops, is is the fact that all these questions require that we integrate data. Uh, so we need to combine these different data sets to arrive at insights. We need to get over the fact or overcome the fact that our sample types are really distinct. Some samples in the assay or in, in our cohort are spatial, others are bulk. We're profiling different bio biomolecules. 
the different cohorts have different compositions. So in our cohort, we have primaries, recurrences, spatial samples. We included some brain mats, other tissues, and so on. We would like to compare our cohort with other cohorts that are publicly available, which may not have these samples. Um, and so we probably need an integration approach that's going to need to bridge across samples, across data types, and across cohorts. So to take on this integration challenge, um, we decided to work at the level of gene expression programs. So gene expression programs are going to be our unit for integration. Um, genes work together and act in concert to maintain cell type identity. Um, and identity programs are going to be really different between GBM cells and cells of the tumor microenvironment. Um, and genes work together to coordinate responses to external signals. So to inflammation, to low, high, low oxygen, hypoxia, et cetera, and to carry out com complex cellular activities. So these are activity programs. So there's two broad classes of gene expression programs that we're interested in. Um, and in an individual cell, you'll have a combination of an identity program, right? A cell, a cell will either be a microglia or not. Um, and then microglial cells will have a dynamic range of other kinds of activity programs. So they could be microglia that are activated in some way or in another way and so on and so forth. So these activity programs can be continuous or discrete um, and you can have the same activity program be active across different kinds of cells. So a key challenge to inferring gene expression programs is that individual, individual cells can express multiple of these uh, programs and the expression profile that we measure is a combination of all these things. So we need to deconvolute these gene expression programs. And the tool that we use for that is, is a consensus non-negative matrix factorization. Um, it's basically, um, it's a way to decouple from an observed gene expression program, um, the contribution of identity programs in your sample and activity programs in your sample, such that you can then assign to each cell or sample um, both an identity and a gene expression program, and you can quantify how much of a program is used in every sample. Um, so this, this is systematic, it's unsupervised. We would like to do unsupervised discovery in these samples because it's cancer and we expect to find unknown things, especially when we're profiling um, uh, really deeply into sample types that haven't been deeply profiled before, like spatial and, and recurrent data sets. Um, and so we run CNMF um, and the, the method overview is very simplistically drawn here. You basically put in a samples by gene matrix. Um, you perform a factorization to identify these gene expression programs and how, how much they're used per cell. So at the end, you get a usage and the gene expression program definition. Um, and our question, so that, so that approach works well. And in that paper, uh, it works really well for single cell data, which is what it was developed for. We wondered if it would perform really well in the context of bulk data. There's some advantages to using CNMF over other kinds of uh, matrix factorization approaches. Um, so we wanted to um, try it out in the context of bulk data where we're not gonna identify only activity and identity programs. We're probably gonna also identify possibly called meta programs or combination programs, which represent unvarying combinations of activity and identity programs, right? So we can deconvolute identity and activities but only if they become decoupled at some point so that we have evidence that they're actually independent things that are mixing together. So we would like to apply CNMF to our spatial profiling data. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. We wanna apply CNMF to our global proteomics data, um, not just to understand the structure of gene expression programs within our cohort, but to be able to map across cohorts. And then we wanna integrate all of this together. So. Um, so let me tell you about our spatial data first. Uh, we have these XYZ samples. We also have single samples. We have longitudinal samples. Essentially what we did is we, uh, we, we took cores from FFP samples, which pres preserved the morphology of the tissue really well. 
Um, and we were interested in capturing gene expression from distinct cell populations within the tumor with this spatial resolution, which is kind of macroscopic, right? You're taking a millimeter here, a millimeter here, and a millimeter here. Um, and the cell populations we were interested in are microglia. They're labeled here in red. And you can see how varied they are in terms of their um, abundance and pattern of infiltration in these different tissues. We're interested in the vasculature. So here we see nice little well-behaved, normal looking capillaries in the brain. And here we have much larger vessels or hemorrhage um, in, the, um, uh, in this uh, zone, which is um, the enhancing border. We're interested in, we, we actually are interested in tumor cells, which will be possibly uh, GFAP positive, which is an astrocytic marker. However, sometimes they lose the, their G, uh, GFAP positivity. And so, um, um, and so also the negative cells would be, would be tumor cells. And DAPI in this case is nuclei stain. So we took the approach of uh, building a TMA, like I said, and then using the nanostring DSP uh, platform to profile this, these cell populations in space. And the way this platform works, just as a quick overview, is um, is that you can lay your tissue or TMA on a slide, which is then, um, uh, which is then treated with uh, DSP barcode, so barcoded RNA probes. So these are probes that will uh, anneal to 18,000 transcripts. So it's pretty much transcriptome wide, every coding gene is, is captured. Um, and the, the barcode is UV cleavable. So you put these barcodes on, they bind to all your RNA, you stain with your morphology markers, in our case, those three markers, uh, plus, plus the DAPI staining. Um, and then you image your section so you can see which cells are where. And with a very fine uh, high resolution laser, you, you UV cleave the barcodes off of the probes. And then you sequence the barcodes and that gives you a readout of which genes are expressed in those cells that you collected the data from. Um, the na nanostring, I guess, brochure says it's single cell segment resolution. You can get, you can, you can photo activate um, a single cell, but you actually need uh, at least 20 to 50 cells to get a good, decent signal uh, in the output. So it's not quite single cell. It's more single cell type. Um, you can multiplex a lot. We did 96 areas um, in one of these experiments. We've done a couple of experiments now. Um, and we took a, an approach to, a, to collection uh, based on segmentation. So we segmented based on the morphology markers. So IBA1 positive cells, CD34 positive cells, and then all the double negative cells. And we, we performed the whole transcriptome assay. So our TMA looks like this. It's on the right. Um, this is one of our TMAs. So a whole bunch of these one millimeter cores. These highlighted areas are areas that we selected as regions of interest. And then within each one of these area, for instance, in this region 10, um, you can see that there are uh, CD34 positive cells. So that's, those are the tumor vessels. Um, IBA1 positive cells, so all the microglia or macrophages, they're both stained by IBA1. Um, and the GFAP positive cells are sort of mixed in with GFAP negative cells. So we collected all of that, all of the double negative. So from every one of these areas or regions of interest, we collected up to three areas of interest or segments. And it looks like, here's a typical example of what GBM looks like. You have this highly densely growing tumor. It is about 20 to 30% of cells are microglia. So it is highly uh, infiltrated with immune cells. Um, this particular sample is vascularized. You can see the vascular cells are the smallest com component. Uh, and then everything that's left over is the double negative cells. So most cases we had all three segments. In some cases there were not enough CD34 positive cells to collect in that channel. Um, and because it's an imaging, it's a fluorescent imaging assay, you know, the hope is that you're getting all of the IBA1 cells um, collected at once, but it really matters how you set your intensity thresholds uh, for that particular core. So as we were doing this, a pathologist was reviewing an HNE section of the same tumor 
and saying, aha, our, our, um, sorry, our um, immunofluorescence didn't actually capture all of the immune cells that I see in this section. So we need to set the, the threshold for, of intensity lower so that we can capture more of the right cells. When we do that, we also capture GFAP positive cells or tumor cells. So now we're contaminating our IBA1 channel with background signal from the tumor cells. Um, if we didn't do that, we would be leaving behind our IBA1 cells in the tumor channel and not collecting enough. So it's a trade-off in almost every core um, for how clean your signal is going to be because these tumors are so densely growing and it is not like uh, peripheral or epithelial cancers where it's very nice, nicely um, uh, uh, distinguished which cell type is which. These cells are intercalated, so they form a meshwork. So we had this challenge of how to collect the data in the best way. We made our best shot knowing that this was going to be a case that we'll have to uh, deal with in the analysis. Here's another case where there are IBA1 cells, but we definitely see green in that channel. Here's a case where there are almost more macrophages and microglia than tumor cells. Um, and here's a couple of the METs, which are GFAP negative and again, really densely growing. So a breast cancer MET and a lung MET to the brain. Okay, so we have this, we have this DSP data. We collected lots and lots of transcriptomes. We had some key questions that we started out with. Uh, in this case, how many cells do you need? I'm not gonna talk about that part of the analysis. It turns out it's between about 20 and 50 cells. Um, the more relevant question was, given that you know so sometimes our collection was from so few cells or maybe 100, 100 or a few hundred cells, can we detect and overcome this admixture that we know exists between the tumor and the microenvironment? Uh, and we know we couldn't always avoid it because we had to tweak our immunofluorescence uh, thresholds. Um, and so there's two, two ways we can get admixture. One is admixture between the, the channels, right? So in the CD34 channel, uh, we can look at the expression of CD34. It's really high in the CD34 channel and much lower in the other channels. So we did a really good job of capturing all the vessels and not leaving too much behind in the other channels. Uh, for the IBA1, again, the signal for IBA1, which is the gene AIF1, the signal is much, much higher in, in that channel versus the, the others. So we did, we did an okay job at separating those, but not in every case. And then in the GFAP or the double negative channel, if we look at GFAP expression, there's actually lots of expression in, in the other, so in the IBA1 and the CD34. So definitely there's background coming in from the tumors into our TME um, profiles. Um, and we know GFAP is not the only uh, is not only expressed in tumor cells, it's also expressed in cells of the normal brain, so in astrocytes. Um, and in order to be able to correct for this, we actually, we, we use our, uh, we use control samples we included in our tissue microarray, um, and we had both cortex and white matter. And this is important because GBM, as you can see here on the left, is highly infiltrative, and when it grows, it really intercalates everywhere. The gray matter is sort of the surface of our brain and um, these folds that uh, form our cortex um, go in and out and the white matter is right underneath. And sometimes it can be, you can like take a chunk of tumor and you might find both white matter and gray matter uh, uh, contributing to the signal, uh, to the transcriptional sig signal. So we wanted to have representation of both of these kinds of uh, of samples so that we can then assign our transcriptional signals or gene expression profiles to these two sources. Um, okay, so I'm gonna show you some, uh, some NMF results and just a quick primer. What NMF does is it takes your gene expression matrix by samples, it figures out at a certain rank, so let's say, the, and that's groups, so let's say groups of four. So what are the best groups of four where you get four expression profiles and four, um, four usages of those expression profiles. Uh, oops, by, adding, by multiplying these two matrices together, you reconstruct this original matrix. So at every rank, you're basically telling NMF, find the best ways to subset um, the data such that two expression programs are 
used in different amounts across samples, and that explains the data in the best way. So you have to tell NMF how many ranks to run at. Um, and if we, if we run, if we check uh, factors across all segments, so again, CD34 in yellow, IBA1 in pink, GFAP in green, or double negative in green, we find that the first rank, the most obvious distinction, is CD34 cells versus everything else. They're just really different from everything else. They're the most different. Um, if we continue to factorize and we say, what are the best three groups, we start to see um, another metagene that comes out that's actually the IBA1 um, metagene. And so, oops, sorry. The, the, so cell types are really the primary factors when using the whole data set. Um, and if we factor enough, we might be able to find really distinct samples like white matter and cortex, but they don't come out as the first and most obvious difference. If instead we look at just the double negative samples, which are hopefully the tumor cells, um, but also the, the white matter and cortex samples, which are these blue ones, the first distinction in our data is between, uh, is between cortex and everything else. Um, we have to go to rank six to distinguish white matter, which is here. Um, and so that brings the question, how many ranks should, should we scan across? How do you choose the best rank? Um, do any of these ranks distinguish between tumor cell states? Or are they distinguishing between admixture with a TNE versus not? Uh, or are there other features that are being distinguished? Here's IBA1 again. The first distinction is cortex and white matter um, together. So these would be normal microglia versus tumor associated microglia. Um, and at rank five, we see that again, white, this is the first time when white matter and cortex become distinct. So two kinds of microglial states. Um, and then there are other groups or metagenes that correspond to brain mets, primary enriched, recurrence enriched factors. Um, so the question is how many ranks are useful? At low ranks, we see some big differences between normal and tumor. Uh, at mid ranks in the IBA1 data, we see microglia versus macrophages. If we go to higher ranks, we can find subtypes of these cells. So we really need to scan across ranks. And, um, um, and typically when, when people run NMF and see NMF, the idea is that even though you run NMF across many ranks, you end up selecting a rank. So what's the best way to select the rank? You can select it based on stability or some sort of metric that has to do with um, um, how coherent that solution is. So you might pick this rank, but it turns out that we don't know if perhaps this solution is actually better for finding biologically relevant programs in our data. So the rank selection really depends on the question. Is it admixture or more specific programs? Depends on what kind of samples you have, which will affect your what comes out of the data early versus late. Um, it depends which over dispersed genes you use the factorization. Uh, but altogether, it comes down to, um, uh, to us making a decision to, to actually get a, a framework in place for being able to compare in a relevant way across the NMF solution, so across ranks. Um, and so I'm gonna switch from sp spatial profiling to our proteomics data and just talk about that for the end of the talk. And Aksa, can you remind me how much time I have left? I'm sure you can go until maybe max 4, 4.55, so um, less than 10 minutes, and then we can do okay. five-minute question. Yep. Okay, that'll be good. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the global proteomics data, which again is the very next core, so we would like to be able to understand the same kind of biology out of this data, um, and then be able to integrate it back with the spatial profiling data, which as you can see already needs integration between these, um, these segmentation types and, and ranks and so on. So I'm going to show you um, our approach for how we tackled um, this integration across ranks and also between data sets for, for proteomics. Um, and for the proteomics side, we have our data here. Again, our samples span primary tissues, recurrence tissues. We have a number of brain mets in the mix and we have a, a lot of normal samples of white matter and cortex. We wanted to put our results in context with um, data sets already in the literature. The landmark data set for GBM for proteomics is the CPTAC data. So that's 100 primary brain tumors. So this is all green. So there are no recurrences in this data um, and 10 normal, uh, normal samples. Uh, we also pulled in a really different kind of proteomics um, 
uh, so the, the Yonsei data set, which did have both primaries and recurrences and normals, a smaller uh, number. And we also uh, were really interested in this data set from the Diamandis lab. And this was a data set published this year. And it's really unique because instead of profiling a bulk chunk of tissue, what they did is they laser capture micro dissected specific kinds of histologies that are really distinguishing um, GBM. So pathologists will use, for instance, pseudopalisading areas around necrosis to, to, uh, um, to diagnose GBM. If you see this, it's GBM. Other areas in the tumor are highly cellular, so cellular tumor, microvascular proliferation. This is like all, all that um, vasculature that's disrupted and really leaky, and it's really the blood-brain barrier um, that's broken down um, and new vessels being formed at the direction of the tumor cells. And then infiltrative tumor where the cells aren't quite as cellular as the cellular tumor, they're, they're more dispersed. And the leading edge, which is, which is areas of the, the brain that are actively being invaded, but the tumor cell content is really low. And so they did a really nice study where they, they performed proteomics on these kinds of my, laser capture micro dissected areas. And we wanted to put our findings in context with this data as well. So really distinct data sets. Um, we wanted to integrate across the, all of these. So the approach we took is we reprocessed each data set, sorry, we reprocessed each data set with our approach um, independently. So we have still four independent data sets. We try to make them as comparable as possible, but it wasn't possible to make them all comparable. And then for each in independent data set, we performed um, a CNMF, uh, well, we did NMF first, CNMF rank sweep. So we, we calculated um, all, the, um, all the metagenes and usages from rank two to rank 30. So at every rank, remember, we get the inferred gene expression programs and how, uh, and how those are used um, in each sample. So we have these hundreds and hundreds of gene expression programs calculated by CNMF at all these different ranks. Um, and then we take all of these and perform pairwise correlations um, to build a network of highly similar programs across all data sets. So we put all the all the gene expression programs, the distinct biological programs into the same mix and we make a network and we see how it looks. So the network has a structure, we can find communities within the network. And then these communities can be characterized by whether they contain uh, programs that are found across all cohorts or uh, only a subset of cohorts and so on. So I'm gonna just show you in a little bit more detail um, our approach to doing this. So this is with CNMF, we ran, we ran up to ranks um, 30, but we, we calculated um, all the pairwise correlations between all of the gene expression programs found at ranks two to 15 across all data sets. So that, count, that generates a whole lot of correlations. And then we um, restricted to those programs that were correlated to something else, um, at some level, so 0.8 in this case. And from that set of uh, programs, we made a network based on this similarity. Um, there will be other nodes on here that are not correlated with anything else, right? At other ranks or in other data sets, and those we don't show and we don't think that they're, they're relevant. And then we perform community detection on this network. So we find in this case, 10 different communities. We can over, oops, overlay annotations on these communities. So for instance, this green community, community five, has contribution from all of the different cohorts. All these different cohorts have a program that's detected that's really similar to all these other um, data sets. So this community is something shared. Um, many of these communities, so now what I'm showing you is each of the 10 communities and at what rank we found a gene expression program in that community from each data set. So you can see some communities are immediately obvious at rank two. They're the first, you know, one of the first thing that, that comes off or at rank three um, and, and so on and so forth. And so some of these gene expression programs are really prevalent. They're something basic. It's found in all cohorts. Uh, some communities like community one 
are take a, a, a while longer to find. So they're more subtle expression programs and they're not necessarily stable. They will break apart into two at some point. So that's what this, this analysis indicates um, that the stability of this community um, goes to, to two or even more depending on the data set. So these, some of these communities could be further refined. Um, and so we wanna be able to annotate them and we can do this with uh, approaches like SSGSEA, where we add biological interpretation, but we can just leverage the sample information, which is quite rich for all of these data sets. Um, so here's how we do it for our data set. This is where the, um, our FFP cohort falls onto this map. Um, and you can see that our cortex samples, which are this dark blue, are pretty much in this area, which is this community six. So community six is a gene expression program that has to do with cortex. Um, this community has to do with brain mets. Brain mets have gene expression profiles that fall here. White matter is here. This is something shared by all tumors, but not so much uh, normal samples. In the pseudopalisades, or sorry, in the uh, diamandus data, we have these pseudopalisading around necrosis areas, uh, which fall around here, and microvascular proliferation, which falls here. This is community one, the one that I said was unstable. So it probably would break into two communities that are distinguished by these um, histological features. Um, this is the infiltrative tumor. And these samples are leading edge samples and they pretty much correspond to this community that's the white matter and this community that's the cortex. Um, sorry to interrupt, but I think we are at time. Um, so okay. you could just wrap up a little bit. Okay, I just I'll just do like one or two more minutes. Okay, so uh, we can define these communities. Um, it's possible to further refine them, like I said, and um, and we can annotate them. I mean, I just showed you quickly how we, how we would look to see, but we can do this empirically. And we can see, for instance, that some of these communities are highly used in METs or uh, specific to primaries or more specific to recurrences. And I think what I'll do is, is probably skip a few slides in, in a second, but basically we can, we can use this kind of approach um, the examples I showed you, but really the empiric approach to, to, to really annotate these communities. And then we can see how many of these communities are detectable within a single patient and are there patterns within patients. Um, and this is just to show nor like normal uh, cortex versus white matter comes up as really distinct. Here's a tumor where there's not much change between primaries and recurrences and so on and so forth. So we can put all our patients in the context of these maps. So these maps we call the, these, um, meta, uh, these are really um, so, um, like a solution network space. So we would like to understand how our patient gene expression profiles move around in the solution network space and which part of the space is more occupied by recurrences or primaries or programs that have to do with metastasis or leading edge or invasion. So I'm gonna skip a bunch of examples and just go to the, just to the summary slide, um, which is that we, we basically, we, we really need an unsupervised method, um, which is what CNMF is to leverage all the profile genes, which CNMF is unlike NMF able to do. Uh, we can identify communities of these gene expression programs and these really correspond to activities or cell types or probably combinations of these things. Uh, we're working on metrics to, to gauge how solid and stable the community structure is uh, and whether we, you know, going from rank two to 15 is good or we should really be looking higher. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, this, is, this is really a way to, to scan across ranks in a biologically interpretable way um, and it's, um, um, it's, it's letting us actually uh, comprehensively integrate different cohorts with different compositions and annotations and leverage those annotations um, and, and uh, leverage the co composition differences. And I think that ultimately we would like to use these to form the basis for adding on additional data layers. So we have lots of imaging uh, data from these uh, samples and we have mutation patterns and we would like to be able to put these in context with all these gene expression profiles. So this is probably a, a framework that's going to let us do that. So I'll just thank 
my team, especially Varsha, Ted, and Hiwan, who contributed a lot to this work, uh, collaborators here at, and at McGill and funding for my lab. And just in case anyone is looking for positions, we are hiring for postdocs. So shoot me an email if you're um, on the job market or interested in talking about potential projects. Thank you. <laughs>